Thank you, Carly. Yes, White Nights is coming, and uh, for those of you who are going to brave the cold weather, um, it is quite rewarding when you see the images afterwards and see what a beautiful show Olymp um, Melbourne puts on. And uh, yeah, it's just great that we're able to um, to capture those moments. And now that the White Nights has been extended to three nights, it's, it gives you more opportunity. Particularly because uh, quite a large part of the city is set up and you don't want to be running around. So maybe uh, uh, one of the tips I might start with is plan your journey. See where the building's going to be lit up and maybe say you're going to be one night in a certain place and another night in a certain place. You get the best out of the experience. Um, yeah, so I just want to begin by, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, we've got a big birthday coming up and I'll explain what birthday that is. Thank Thank you for indulging the Olympus advert. Um, yeah. So we turn 100 years old this year. Obviously in cameras, as you can do the maths, we turn 83 with, with cameras. But uh, at the moment, yeah, we, we are... Yeah, we are carrying on. Uh, we, 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 we um, 100 years in the business. What we want to be talking about today is, is better um, tips for better nighttime photography. Um, we are a brand that innovates. For those of you who, do, how many Olympus users in the room? Any? Oh, look at that. Thank you. I'm, I'm in a friendly crowd here. I'm singing to the choir, which is great. Uh, we're a brand that innovates. So for those of you who haven't got Olympus, you'll see some of the, some of the uh, features that we have in our cameras that are quite unique and especially unique to nighttime photography. So what I want to do, first of all, is just run through a couple of general tips and speak about why I think these are important. And then I want to deal with three things. How to stabilize your camera, um, uh, whether to shoot in, in, in bulb or another feature that you might have in your camera, especially if you're an Olympus user. And finally, how do I balance my exposures if I'm going to be shooting white nights and incorporate some portraiture into that as well? Because it's great to take a picture of the buildings, but you're probably doing it with people. If you want to put those people into the pictures, um, it's, it's important to know how to balance your exposures. So what I would say, first of all, is carry a tripod. Now, I attended the first white night we have here. Anybody do that when we couldn't move? When we had to shuffle in hundreds across? Yeah, it was quite... Yeah, it was quite frightening, <laughs> especially if you had children with you. Um, luckily, with Olympus's small camera, it's not a problem, but we don't want to be carrying a tripod. So try and carry a tripod, but if you have a small one, make sure it's a small one because you don't want to be bumping into people and, and people bumping into your tripod. Uh, I know that, that Michael's have got the little, you know, the, the smaller versions of tripod. Now, there's so many variations on, on the Gorillapod nowadays that, that it's easy to, to carry a small tripod and still get stabilized, especially because most cameras have a stabilizer built into them. So those little movements that the, the, the smaller tripod's going to make is going to be um, counteracted. Use a wide-angle lens. Remember, we're not out in the, in, in, in the, 
In the field, we, we right up against the buildings, and so you're going to need a nice wide angle lens, uh, preferably a wide zoom so you can frame and, and, and crop the image as you want, uh, but try and get a decent wide lens if you, if you don't have one. Shoot in manual because, um, yeah, just get to know your, your exposure triangle. I would shoot in manual all the time because you're wanting to include movement, you want to exclude movement, you may want to make something brighter. And every time you change a setting on the camera, remember everything else changes to balance the scale of your exposure. So understanding and, and knowing how to manipulate your exposure triangle is going to be so much easier. That's why I recommend shooting in manual. Also shoot in RAW. Um, RAW is just, especially for nighttime photography, is just so much easier. Um, so everybody understands the difference between JPEG and RAW? Yeah? Good. So if you shoot with just digits, it's easier to change digits than to manipulate a finished image. So shoot in RAW if you can. There's so much more recovery. Uh, this is an example of a, of a JPEG that, I, that I, I took on the Scottish border. Um, the sun was setting behind this building uh, and pulling as much as I could out of the JPEG, that's the best I could get. But going to the corresponding RAW, I was able to get that out of it. So you can just see how much more there is in the RAW that you can pull out, especially at night. My next tip would be um, take some test shots. Um, so just, yeah, we, we're not shooting with a spool of 36 images. We've got tons of space on our sensors, so, I mean, uh, on our cards. So, so walk around, take as many shots from as many different angles as you can, change it up, experiment. Change your white, if you're shooting, and it doesn't matter in RAW, but if you are shooting in JPEG, change your white balance, put some art filters in, see how you can make the image look different. Because remember, there's going to be thousands of people standing next to you. You don't want your picture to be the same as everybody else's. So experiment, do something different. Uh, perhaps uh, bracketing. So I was lucky um, about five or six years ago to, to be stuck in, in Kyoto with Carly's father. Um, and the two of us went for a walk around Kyoto at about four o'clock in the morning. And uh, we came across this beautiful temple door and just with a very dominant bright light there and the only way we could get a decent shot out of it was bracketing. Now most of the cameras nowadays have got the little HDR feature on them, takes three images and blends them together. It's exactly what I did here, fantastic results. Remember you're going to be working with a lot of different exposures, dark skies, different colored lights, so try using bracketing as well and you'll get some very good results. Play with your shutter speeds. On that very same evening there was snow falling and by slowing my shutter speed down you can see these lovely streaks coming through or actually snow falling through the trees. So you'll be doing that exactly the same thing when you'll be doing, uh, if you're filming moving subjects. So during white nights there's going to be trains running, there's going to be trams running. You want to get that lovely flow of movement through your image and not just a stable picture of a, a lit up building. Um, it's wonderful that there'll be so many people moving around. You can get the blurred people in the foreground with the stable subjects in the background. Just adds that sort of nuance, that narrative to the story that you're trying to tell with your photograph. So, so play with shutter speeds. Uh, as you can see, the reflection in the water, look for reflections. Reflections are wonderful when you're shooting at night, um, particularly when, the, when, when there's a large amount of water. We've got the river here, so we can use the Yarra to get some beautiful reflections. And finally, when we're talking about Light, try and use some backlighting as well. Backlighting is, is, is fantastic. So there's going to be bright lights. Stick some subjects in front of those lights to get some nice rim lights around the subjects, lights in the building, and uh, we can go from there. So just talking about our exposure triangle. We need to just quickly understand, um, most of you look like experienced photographers, I'm sure you do understand it. We all know what it does, but let's just talk about the side effects for a moment. So aperture, we need to think of aperture as the amount of light coming into the camera. Shutter as the duration of the light coming into the camera. And ISO as the sensitivity of the light coming into the camera. So those three will create your exposure triangle. Sorry, the exposure going backwards again, sorry your exposure triangle. Okay, and of course in the middle of our exposure triangle we have the little meter. And it's wonderful today, our cameras have 
digital cameras have got meters on them. We can even have uh, pull up our histogram so we can see whether uh, we've got our exposure right. So, um, and that becomes even easier with a mirrorless system as well. So if we think about aperture again, what is the side effects of it? Well, the first one is depth of field. We all know that. But another really interesting side effect which we'll be using in night photography is the fact that if you close it right down to f22, you can get those lovely star effects in your light. So think about stabilizing that camera, getting your, your, your apertures as small as possible, and then you'll be able to start introducing some interesting look to the lights. Shutter speed is all about duration, and so therefore it's, we're going to be able to control motion. So do we want a blur in our picture, or do we want a stable or a still picture? And we're going to be using our shutter speed to have a look at uh, the sort of movement we want in the picture. But another side effect, of course, is your ambient exposure, exposure for flash. And I'll talk a bit more about it at the end. But the way that we control our ambient light when we're using a flash for portraiture is by controlling it with our shutter. And lastly, the horrible side effect here is noise. And particularly when we're shooting uh, areas where there's bright lights and then black skies, you want to shoot with as low an ISO as you, as you can because you don't want to exaggerate the noise that's in the blacks. Uh, we've all seen long exposures where our skies go grey when they should be black, so we want to try and keep it as clean as possible. Okay, so the first of all, these are general tips that everybody can use, but I just want to talk about three things now. Stabilization versus the trap. You know, we're going to need to stabilize our cameras, obviously, uh, long exposures. Do we go tripod or do we handheld with our stabilizers? What is bulb? What is live time and what is live composite? And here's where all the Olympus users are going to, uh, non Olympus users are going to get really jealous when you can see what Live Composite does. And then lastly, balancing exposures for nighttime portraits. So, those are the three things that I briefly want to talk about today. And then we'll talk about some, uh, or we'll open the floor up to some questions. Can't promise I'll answer all of them, but hopefully I'll be able to answer quite a few. So, the first thing is stabilization. Um, when you're shooting on a tripod, we obviously want to get it as good a tripod as possible, but what I was saying is try and make it small, particularly when it's very busy. Um, however, with stabilization in cameras nowadays, you can get excellent results. Um, with our new camera, the EM1X, uh, that we released in January this year, uh, with this lens here, the, the 12 to 100 constant f4, um, it has sync. And so what happens is the camera is able to talk to the, um, to the lens and together they correct the stabilization and from this camera and lens combination you can get seven and a half stops of stabilization. Okay, so now remember we, if we go back to that exposure triangle, think how, how, how effective seven and a half stops can be. Okay, it's, it's, it's incredible. What that means is I can now um, take my camera off the tripod and get some fantastic results. So when this camera was, well, before this camera was released, I was fortunate enough to go to Japan for the, uh, the training uh, b before release. And this is one of the images that I took that evening in Hachioji, Japan, which is near our head office. You can see everybody here trying to stand as still as they can because we're all trying to see how well we can take a sharp image or how long we can handhold the camera for. So if I look at those lights up that are near the middle of the screen and I just blow them up a bit, that's pretty sharp, yeah? How long would you say that is? There's the X of data there. It's a 13 second exposure handheld. But given it was Japan, and if anybody's tasted Japanese coffee, you know I didn't have any coffee that day. <laughs> so um, I was pretty stable, but yeah, that's the best that I could have possibly have managed. But I mean, yeah. And we're not, advocate, we're not suggesting that you go around taking 13 second shots, of course. But what it does mean is that your half second exposure, one second exposure, two second exposure, you're going to get some pretty decent results out of it. Okay. So when you are using a tripod, and if it's going to be a very long exposure, go into the drive mode now, camera, and you'll see the single shot with the diamond next to it. And what that does is it stops any shake inside the camera when you are taking a long exposure. So uh, for those of you who've done coffee on Olympus, we've spoken that, about that before. Um, the other thing that you might want to do is instead of pressing the camera when, it's, when you're doing a really long exposure on a tripod, is maybe just syncing to your mobile phone and using your mobile phone as your shutter release. Uh, with Olympus cameras, they link, uh, 
up to the app and then you're instead of touching the camera when it's on a tripod you can use your camera to take the photograph anywhere you you'll, you'll phone becomes live and you can see what you're getting through the camera and anywhere you touch on your phone screen selects exactly the same focal point on your camera and takes the shot so that's quite an effective way of getting around the uh, shutter cable we can use that another nice thing with long exposure is um, again in the em1x we've introduced live neutral density filters which is great during the day, uh, it's great at dusk, and it enables you to, uh, instead of carry a range of filters around, digitally, when you're in manual mode, you can go in and switch on these neutral density filters. So through your live preview, you just then obviously press your menu and it jumps up and you can select either two, four, eight, 16, or 32. And you can turn it on and what you actually see through your viewfinder is the same creaminess or the same movement that you're going to get out of the finished result. And so here we see that's really what your viewfinder looks like. It slows everything down and you see how creamy the movement in the water is so that once you take the shot you know exactly what it's going to look like. And that's the advantage of mirrorless. With mirrorless you're not taking a shot and then looking at the screen, taking a shot, look at the screen. What you see is what you're going to get. And now adding some neutral density filters and it just adds so much more of a, um, uh, you know, the ability to take some fantastic long exposures. Okay, so what about bulb and live time and live composite? We've all shot in bulb before, yeah? Most people shot in bulb. What's the problem with bulb? You don't quite know what you're getting, do you? And because there's no processing happening in the camera while the bulb is taking place, once you close the shutter, we all then have to sit and wait for the processor to kick in. And we can go grab a cup of coffee, come back, and it's still going on, and yeah. And it takes a long time, and a lot of it, because it's hit and miss, it can become a very frustrating uh, process. And if you haven't got uh, patience, like some of us, it becomes extremely um, frustrating. I remember once before this feature came out in our cameras, I was in, uh, in the valley in, in uh, Cataract Gorge in Launceston, and um, I think one of the factories opened up their gates and let a whole lot of water come down, and it was 45 minutes into a long exposure. And suddenly this warm water came down the river and everything fogged up, and there was gone. So yeah, it can get very frustrating when things like that happen. So what Olympus did is we, we introduced something called live time. And what live time is, is live bulb. So all you do is set up for the, for the image, press your shutter, and you stand back and you watch the image processing and developing on the screen in front of you. And what happens on that screen is because you have a histogram, you can actually see your exposures changing. And when you feel it's right and you like what you see, press the shutter a second time and it begins to then process and you've got the picture. So it takes all the guesswork out of bulb, okay, which is a fantastic feature and everybody said, could it ever get better than that? And then we introduced Live Composite. So for those of you who don't know what Live Composite is, it's a fantastic new feature. It enables you to take pictures like this very, very easy. So instead of opening the shutter the way that bulb or Live, or, or, or live Time would do, what Live Composite does is it enables you to set your camera up for a base image. So this was the um, just after the fires in Port Stephens. Um, they were pretty nervous about me throwing sparks around just after the fire in Port Stephens, but the fire in Port Stephens had burnt down part of the brewery that we were at. So they were dispensing their beers out of this little container that they'd cut away and they called it the hop box and they asked me for a nice picture of it for their Instagram page. So what I did was I set up the base exposure which was going to be of the container. It was a three second exposure and so what I did is press the shutter and then it took Instead of taking a, in fact, this was about a three and a half minute exposure altogether. Instead of taking a three and a half minute exposure where the blacks in the background would have been gray, instead it took three second exposures over and over and over again. But as I introduced new light, it wrote, it, it, it wrote that new light onto the sensor over a darker uh, pixel before. So any new light that's darker than a pixel existing on the sensor is going to be added. And so what I did was I got a flashlight from the side and I lit the box 
until, and I kept walking back and seeing whether it looked good on the screen when I was happy with it. I went behind the container, put some steel wool in a whisk, set it on fire, twirled it around, got all these lovely sparks, came back and had a look to see whether I just where I wanted to touch it up with the torch. When my exposure was where I wanted it, I simply pressed the shutter again and I didn't have to wait because all the throughout that three seconds it was compositing, compositing my image immediately. So when you press the shutter, boom, the finished image comes up and you can start again. So it cuts away all that time of waiting for the processing to happen and it enables you to get extremely creative with your light painting. Some of the examples I'll show you. So this is the, um, the boat shed down in Launceston. So this is a, a floating, um, what do you call them, pontoons or whatever, they, they flo fl floating sort of platform in the middle of the river. Set the camera up. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a timer, so I could run off the, the floating thing without moving the, uh, moving the tripod. Uh, and as it started going, I then ran into the scene and I lit up my blades and just walked through the image and painted this lovely light into the scene. We did the same in one of the, um, one of the alleyways in, in, um, in uh, Hobart. And so here, obviously just painting with the light down and then getting a torch and just lighting bits of the, the stairwell up. And then over here, we lit the stairwell up and then I grabbed one of my lights and ran up the stairs and painted it all the way up to the top. Okay, so you can get really creative. Uh, we use exactly the same technique to do the ball of light. And we did this in, in the new bridge that's just gone up in Launceston. And uh, if you're wondering what this lovely little flames of fire over here, those are my... Um, my Adidas trainers getting lit up by the ball as I was swinging it. So as I was moving around and my feet were moving through the image, the light was lighting my feet up. But as you can see, I'm not in the image, which is great. Because I was wearing dark clothing, any bright pixels behind me are going to overwrite where I would be in the image. And so live composite becomes a fantastic new tool. Just uh, one thing I don't have a picture of up here, but think about it, uh, is, is a lightning storm. Uh, the problem with a lightning storm is when you set your camera up on bulb and there's a cityscape in the foreground, those city lights get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and eventually you have to stop and start again while you're waiting for the lightning. But with live composite what happens is you set the exposure for that cityscape. Click and you know the cityscape is perfect, it doesn't change. As the different lightning strikes come in now, it paints the lightning strike into the scene but the cityscape doesn't get any brighter, it stays exactly as it was in the first image. So your, 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 your uh, storm scenes become so much more vivid and it looks like, I mean you can set it up for two hours and have 12 lightning strikes through your image. And again, the city is going to stay exactly as it was the first time. So that's fantastic. Next thing I want to talk about is using speed lights to balance exposure. So this is really late afternoon. As you can see, it was a wedding that I shot in, on the Gold Coast last year. Um, if we leave our cameras on automatic metering, what happens? Because it's so bright, we end up with a silhouette, yeah? If we go to spot metering, what happens is we blow the background out. So what we want to do, particularly when we're shooting at night or at dusk and dawn, we want to try and balance those two exposures and end up with something that is halfway between. So we've lit our subject, but we've still got a lovely background. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to buy a nice little flash. And because we don't want flash to be direct, you never want to put your flash on your camera. If your flash is on your camera, you can bounce it off a wall or off a roof, but try and never point a flash at your subject. The beautiful thing about our new uh, FL700 flashes, it's got a built-in receiver. So simply by turning it on, um, and setting it to, to A1 in its channels and then setting on my, turning this on, I can now take a picture off camera. So now instead of me taking a picture that's going to flatten your face, I can take it from here and lovely contours of light across your face. So try and try when working with, um, with flash, uh, get a trigger. I know that, yes, this is the Olympus setup, but I know that um, most brands have got a similar um, a similar setup and if you're working with a budget, um, Michaels also sell the Harnell system which is really inexpensive, enables you to do it. It doesn't give you TTL but if you know how to work with manual flash it, it works perfectly. So how do I balance those two explosions? If we look at this image here, it's beautiful. Um, what we'd normally find with the flash is the subject's lit up and the black background's just gone. So how do we introduce that light in the background? 
Well, the way we introduce light, that light in the background is by understanding our two exposures. Because we no longer have one exposure, we now have two. The first one is the ambient light, all that stuff in the background. The second one is the strobe light or the flash exposure that's going to light my subject. Okay, so we also need to understand what a guard number is. Do we all understand guard number? When you buy a flash, there's a number that will say this is a guard number. So we have three flashes. We have our 600, which is a 36 guard number, our 700, which is a 42 guard number, and then our pro flash, the 900, which is a 58 guard number. Most flashes are around the 36 or 58, and most brands have got a variety of flashes. So when you buy your guard number, it's going to enable you to see what your working distance is. So your guard number, whichever that is on the flash, or whatever you set the flash to, because you can set a variable guard number, um, divided by my aperture. So if I'm working at f4, I divide that into whatever the guard number is, and that's going to give me my working distance in meters at 100 ISO. So I'll give you an example here. If my guard number is 42, so I've got full power on my flash, and my aperture is 5.6, I divide 5.6 into 42 and my maximum working distance at 100 ISO is going to be 7.5 meters. Okay? So understand your working distance because uh, who's been to the, the MCG and somebody's got a little camera and they try and light the whole stadium up with their flash. <laughs> and they just get a dark picture and the poor bald man in front has got a lovely Christmas light on his head. So yeah, we don't want to yeah, we've got to understand how we use flash, and guard number is very important because the flash is only going to throw a couple of meters. It's better to turn the flash off when you're in the MCG and just take a picture as is. Okay, so once we understand our, our, our working distance, we know how close we need to be to our subject, and then we can work out how much strobe light to throw on and our ambient light. And a lot of people tell us, oh, I'm a natural light shooter, and the reason they say that is because they don't know how to work with flash. And it's really simple. And when you understand how, it just opens the world up for you. Um, you know, quite often people come to a Coffee on Olympus or a training session, they tell me what lenses they have and they say, what do I buy next? And I will always say, get yourself a flash and a trigger. Because that just brings everything, you know, just changes your portraiture, it changes everything. And, um, and this is, remember, flash is not only for, for working at night, uh, portraiture during the day with a flash is even better because what we can do is darken that background, bring a, a, more, more uh, drama into our background, then light our subject and it changes everything. And I'll show you an image of what I'm talking about later. Okay, so how do I control those two exposures? Well, we've got three things. We've got aperture and ISO, which are going to control both exposures. Okay, then I've got my available light, my ambient light, and I have my flash power. So the way that I control my background light, my ambient light, is shutter speed, aperture and ISO. So that gives me my ambient light. My second exposure is aperture, ISO and flash power. All right. So if I can work out my guard number, how far, how close am I going to be to my subject? And then I ignore that and I set the picture up to take a lovely picture of the background with the lovely lights coming through, then put my subject in, focus on my subject and let the flash power go. I'm still going to get all that beautiful lights in the background because I've set my ambient light correctly. Most flashes will automatically shoot at around about 60th of a second, 200th of a second. They're going to get rid of the background. If I drop that flash down to a tenth of a second, I've got my stabilizer, which is easily going to be able to, be able to allow me to handheld my camera a tenth of a second. If my model stands nice and still, boom, I can get all that lovely light coming in that a tenth of a second exposure is going to allow me to get, but my flash is going to light the subject as well. So I understand the two, and it works pretty well. Uh, just one thing you do need to understand is um, the closer I get to my subject with my flash, the softer the shadows are going to be across their face. Okay, so uh, rather than change, ra rather than um, changing the amount of light falling onto your subject by pulling the flash further or closer to your subject, rather actually change it manually. 
Because remember, I, I might be a meter away from you and there's a bit too much light. And if I step backwards, not only am I taking a bit of the light away, but suddenly the shadows on your face are becoming harder and harder and harder. So if you want to get lovely soft shadows, you still need to be close up to your subject. So rather change the flash power to get the exposure that you want. So why does this work? Well, I'll give you an example here. Every one of these pictures is taken at f10, but that's 60th of a second. Look at the background. We can't see what's in the background. 30th of a second, 15th of a second, we can start seeing what's in the background. 8th of a second, and then of course, 4th of a second, we can now suddenly see what's in the background. So the aperture hasn't changed. The flash on my subject has changed slightly, but not much. But look how much the background has changed. And that's simply by changing the shutter speed. So that's how I control my ambient exposure. And then of course with the flash I see how much is falling on my little model. And I'm ready to go. And we all understand flash. So now at white nights we can get those beautiful lights in the background and still throw a decent amount of light onto our friends. Rather than lighting our friends up and having a really poor looking background. Okay, so by balancing the two we can work it out. So why is this... So, why does it work? Well, because most flashes, so as the Olympus ones here, the actual pulse of light that comes out of your flash is between a 500th of a second and 1 20,000th of a second. Okay, so it's, it's quicker than any shutter speed you're going to be using, which means shutter speed is not going to affect my flash at all because it's just so quick. On the other hand, um, a shutter speed of 250th will not affect the flash because uh, it, only affects the, it only affects the ambient exposure because if I've got my model there, and I, no matter what um, guard number I've got my flash set to, if it's correct for my model, there's no way that light is going to carry all the way to the buildings in the background. And so my flash is not going to affect the buildings, but the shutter speed is not going to affect my flash. And that's how I know that I can balance both. Okay. And yeah, so we make our subject more natural by brightening the ambient exposure and dropping the flash. So lots of ambient light, little bit of flash. And then we make our subject more dramatic by doing exactly the opposite. Add flash and drop the ambient exposure. And that's what I mean. It's a very natural looking shot. We have balanced the two. But here I want more light on my subject, less light on the leaves behind. And so by simply going back to my exposure triangle, understanding the flash and changing the two, I'm able to get exactly the same shot with a completely different look to it. Okay. As I said, you don't want to be using um, direct flash, so think about buying a trigger. Uh, for those of you who are Olympus users, the FL700 works perfectly with the little um, trigger that we have because you no longer need a receiver. The, the, this uh, flash has got a built-in receiver, but as I said, there are other brands that you can use as well, third party that enable you to trigger your flash off the camera. And by doing so, you're able to get really nice looking light like this at night. Okay, the white balance is completely out here, yes, but that's obviously part of the look. So with our, our, our system, we have a 30 meter range with this, so I can have my flash 30 meters away from me. Now think of white nights, you may be able to set it up on a tripod, go away, set your subject up, and boom, take some beautiful pictures. Uh, you can use it behind your subject, so you can get that lovely backlighting that I was talking about earlier. And even, although we're talking about night photography, the flash works perfectly during the day as well. So instead of blowing your sky out, you can drop the exposure, get a lovely blue sky, and then still take the picture. Uh, lastly, I just want to talk about um, if you are familiar with flash and you do use it and you think, yeah, I've been that, done that, something you may not have done before is used color correction gels. Now, in something like uh, Dusk and Dawn, and particularly now at White Nights with the, the, the colors lighting up the buildings, color correction gels are fantastic. Because if I've got a building that's lit up and it's white and I want it to look something special, I can change my, my, my um, white balance to make the building go blue, okay, by putting a fluorescent white balance on. The problem is my model, or my, my, my friends that are with me, their skin's also going to go blue, right? So then simply put a nice orange correction gel into the flash, it corrects their skin tone, and so what you get is a Blue, if I, if I, so, so this is a, a blue uh, gel where I've set my white balance to make the sky go nice and brown. 
and it's corrected her skin tone. And then here I've set my white balance to 3100, the sky's gone blue, and my orange gel has lit her face to correct her skin tones. So it's a great way of now experimenting, changing the color of the background, the foreground, everything by using color correction gels. Okay, so that's just three things that I've spoken about today. I see the timer says there's two minutes left for, for questions. So um, hopefully I can ask, I can't answer all questions, but if there are some that you'd like me to answer. Um, yeah, thank you for listening and I hope you get some fantastic images over the next few weeks. <laughs>